Chapter 31 Kinder Waters The voyage south was slow and hard going. What little rations they'd managed to salvage from the camp at Thulhofen had to be shared between the hungry Archonauts and the two dozen full-grown Fomorians they'd pulled from the wreckage of the fleet. The godsmen they had left on Thule. Jim had drifted in and out of awareness during those first few hours as the Archon rushed among the barely floating hulks of the ruined fleet. Godsmen and pirate alike were pulled from the water with rope and hook, taken below and wrapped in blankets torn from the spare sails. Before long, the prisoners vastly outnumbered their Archonaut guards, but were too defeated and half-drowned to muster any threat. At the start, the Archon's drogue lines were mobbed with frantic pirates fighting for survival, but after a few well-aimed shots from Darge's sling, and more than one drowning among competing sailors, the rescue calmed and grew more orderly. Some, of course, refused the help of the heretic ship. One of the largest islands of wreckage, the upturned keel of the mighty Sea Eater, had been commandeered by a group of fanatical pars who knelt shivering in the stiff breeze and prayed for salvation, even as their brethren kicked and beat at less fortunate sailors attempting to clamber aboard the wreck. When the Archon had come alongside and offered its lines, Slip's offer of rescue was met with jeers and angry rebuttals. We do not need your help, heathen, called their leader defiantly. For we pray, and the Lord will surely send us salvation. What do you call this? barked Kaber, shaking one of the thick drogue lines that hung from the gunwales into the water. He bloody has, hasn't he? But they returned to their prayers just the same, even as one or two of their number slipped quietly into the water and swam for the ship. With a shiver, Jim thought he heard once more the voice of old blind John Kane calling out from the water for a drogue line, but after the first few pars had scrambled over the gunwales, Nix untied the line and let it drop back to the water with a splash, spitting viciously after it as it fell. Throughout the rescue, she marched along the deck and among the prisoners, Jim's wrench knife clutched in hand, searching, he presumed, for Rasmus and revenge for her kin. But the erstwhile leader of the godsmen was nowhere to be found among the ruins of Lotan's fury. Saar alone had been offered passage south, out of gratitude for his saving cap from drowning, but after a private parley with the captain, was allowed to select a skeleton crew from among the surviving Fomorians to accompany him south. There was more than a little outrage among the crew, and Darge had to be held back by Boulder when Saar grinned at her, taunting, but a little while later, his price was revealed. You watch, grinned Gam, who of course had heard everything, and he gestured towards Slip and Waylon, who were making a great effort at discretion as they strolled toward the aft castle stair and pried open the false panel that hid the stash locker. Jim gasped as two large sacks were withdrawn, spilling a handful of the crystal coins onto the deck. Sars price for his crew, whispered Gam. That's why he wanted the Arkham so bad. It was his only way to get it past the godsmen. Once the last of the willing survivors had been dragged from the water, the Archon lay anchor in the wide harbour of Thulhofen, where teams went ashore to strip the town and its surroundings of resources for the voyage. Enough food was taken to sustain the ship and her prisoners until the nearest port, the rest being left to feed the new unlikely colony of pirates and godsmen that would remain here, devoid of any vessel that might allow them to bring more harm to the world. A great many long guns were recovered from the town and what remained of the camp atop the mountainside, and all were thrown into the icy waters of the bay. No more of the crystal coins that held the secrets of the ancient Scand had survived, but more than fifty chests of unspoiled seeds that had yet to be burned upon the church pyres were brought aboard, along with a limping and huddled figure who trod carefully along the gangway, clutching Slip's arm. Rinks, whose actions, as Jim had learned from Gam, had proved critical in securing the Archonauts' escape from the seed vault, 
even as it had sealed her fate as a prisoner of the godsman. The once proud splicer was led to the captain's own quarters, and Kelpie sent to see to her comfort. Kaber dragged a sled of salvaged tech behind Waylon. Jim recognised more than one of the ancient machines that had been able to read the coins, though what was more astonishing was the eagerness with which Kaber seemed to help, and indeed even obey Waylon, formerly the victim of his worse affections. Once the tech was safely stowed in the shielded workshop, Kaber approached Jim with the heavy frown of one conflicted, and hesitated a few paces away. Gam squeezed Jim's shoulder and made himself scarce. Jim felt a lump rise in his throat. The last interaction he'd had with Kaber, he'd had a knife pressed to his ribs. But now the huge, hot-tempered boy seemed almost embarrassed, his tail between his legs. I wanted to say thanks, he mumbled. And sorry about the tussle and all that before, not trusting you, like, Truth is, we'd all still be in the fact mess if it weren't for you, I reckon. He reached into his trashlander furs and gently withdrew more fur, cupping it gently between his hands. I snatched this from the seed vault there. Figured it reminded me of your one back on your workshop. And with that, he leaned down and gently goaded the young rat from his hands into Jim's. The little creature sniffed at Jim's fingers and padded around in his palm before nestling in the crook of his elbow. Jim felt the lump in his throat choke any reply and his eyes began to sting from the cold. He looked up at Kaber to thank him, but the older boy was already a dozen paces away, the moment forgotten. It wasn't the first time he'd been credited with the escape from the seed vault, nor the first token he'd been given in gratitude. Daj had inscribed his name on one of her sling stones and offered to keep an eye out for him. And Kelpie had cleaned up the purple sash that had stemmed the bleeding from his calf and added a cunning embroidery of a dragon that appeared to cling to his face when it was fastened back across his smicken eye. A handful of others had shared morsels of food or trinkets from past spoils. He tried to tell people that he hadn't even really had a plan for the escape not beyond using the magflies and the magnet to chew through the rusty hinges, but they'd mistaken it for modesty or bashfulness and thanked him all the same. The truth is, from what he'd been told, the escape had been equal parts luck and the cunning of his friends. Waylon had dealt with the door, Gam had destructed their captors with the other radio handset, and Boulder, Daj and Kaber had held off the full groans long enough for North to lead them from the vault. Even then, it would have been all for nothing if not for Rinx, who upon being escorted down from the mountaintop camp had managed to snatch a weapon from her captors and create enough havoc to see the escaping Arconauts safely to the ice cave, where they overpowered the unsuspecting Fomorians that had been left in charge of repairs. Rinx was the hero, truly, and Waylon and Gam and the others. All Jim felt between the numbing doses of licks that were administered thrice daily, was an overwhelming guilt. He'd sought a headcount for the new colony at Thulhofen, that he might have some idea exactly how many souls had been lost when Lotan came, but either nobody knew, or orders had been given not to tell him. His friends tried to comfort him, and persuade him it was necessary or somehow out of his control but none of that seemed to dissuade the drowned faces of sailors that floated through his dreams at night. But as they sailed south, the air and water growing warmer, the nightmares began to abate, and Thule, with all of its frozen wonders and horrors, was left behind. Under Kelpie's attentive care, the angry and savage wound at his right wrist began to knit though the healing did nothing to forestall the frequent unscratchable itches that plagued his missing hand. On the seventh day out of Thule, Waylon came to him, clutching a bundle of oiled cloth. I don't want you to get too excited, said the techsmith, who seemed to have shed the bluster and uncertainty that usually accompanied his words. There's a long way to go, and I'm not certain it'll even work. Not fully, but... 
He pulled back the oiled cloth to reveal the intricate metallic hand they had stolen from Node's lair. It had been modified by hands clearly not as skilled as Node's, wires trailing like nerves from the wrist where a crude copper brace had been fashioned with leather straps. Waylon offered it toward Jim, who was quite overwhelmed at the piece, but allowed his friend to fit it to his arm, carefully positioning the wires and cinching the straps tight as Jim winced against the pain. What do I do? asked Jim, finding his arm heavy as he brought the metal hand closer to inspect it. Just try to open your fist, said Waylon gently, just like you would have before. Gritting his teeth, Jim flexed raw and ruined muscles that had not been moved since Lotan had torn the hand from his wrist. At first, there was nothing. But suddenly, the metal hand wrenched open, the last two fingers spasming erratically, the thumb staying folded across the palm. Waylon leaned forward and flipped a small switch, and the movement stopped dead. Sorry, he muttered, loosening the straps. Still a lot of Nold's old code left in there. I'm doing my best to clear it out. It's brilliant, Jim marvelled, smiling in astonishment at his friend who blushed at the compliment, a problem that was occurring more and more often for him ever since the seed vault. The curiosity and confidence with which he set about investigating the code they'd salvaged was staggering. In the weeks that followed, he had not only refined the metal hand to the degree that Jim could confidently work the ship's ropes, but even so far that he could begin to use it for signing with Gam and Nix. He had also designed a simple device that tracked their heading with a compass and their speed with a small paddle mounted just below the waterline, both devices then feeding this information back to the map table to give a surprisingly accurate estimate of their position. Wayland's newfound confidence wasn't the only change aboard the Archon. After a fortnight of grim rations and burned gruel, the twins Bink and Duke had approached the captain and asked to be installed as the new ship's cooks. From that day forth, the galley was a noisy, chaotic mess, the two of them often sparring as they fought to wrestle a meal from the scant supplies, but the food improved dramatically overseen by Scup's trusty ladle, which they mounted above the stove, tied with his purple sash. Nix approached Waylon during the voyage and had begun exploring the idea of reactivating her implant. Soon, after a nervous but rather successful operation overseen by Kelpie, there was a switch installed and a dial to control the sensitivity. Sometimes now, if the evening was particularly still, Nix would activate the device, and could be heard humming to herself, or be seen watching the birds swoop about the mast with Gam, who helped her through the overwhelming sensation of sound and noise. But mostly, it stayed off. Gam's hand sign continued to improve, and Nix would often join him on watch, scanning the horizon from the solitude of the mainmast while he manned the foremast, the two of them silently chatting across the distance. The captive Fomorians mostly kept to themselves, other than a few half-hearted attempts to take over the ship, for which the mutineers paid with a night or two in the gibbet. Cap simply laughed these endeavours off, explaining that it was in every pirate's nature to try and escape, and he'd be more worried if they'd behaved themselves. Tsar, a king among the prisoners, held court below deck often entertaining off-duty members of the Archon's crew with his tales alongside the full-grown Fomorians. Twice a day he was permitted to walk the deck to take air, though Daj guarded him like a hound, her jaw set and knuckles white against the haft of her sling. Eventually, their meandering course south brought them to Vitsamar, where they'd agreed to set the Rugian captives free. Sar's face when Cap returned across the harbour with the ship that he'd promised was a sight Jim suspected he would never forget. The elderly Vitz woman clutched her newfound fortune of bar coin with glee as the Fomorians mournfully clambered from the Archon into the battered old cattle barge, still occupied by a half-dozen of the sorry animals and ankle-deep with their filth. Poor Shomek, Sar grumbled. <laughs> 
shaking his head at the sorry state of the vessel as one of the hungry cattle licked at his sleeve. Livestock? Really? Cap spread his hands. Hey, I told you where the ship would be and when. Don't recall telling you what would be on it. He threw his head back then and laughed, tossing a bucket down from the Archon's gunnels. Best get bailing, sir. I don't think she's quite watertight. Jim watched as the Fomorians squabbled for space aboard the stinking barge. Sar tossed the bucket to Ogan and ordered him to start bailing, but not before removing a small purse that seemed to be stashed inside. Jim could have sworn he saw the familiar glint of crystal in the old pirate's hands as he waved farewell. Jim wondered what would become of him now. Sar was a ruthless survivor, full of his own brand of vitality and verve. It seemed impossible that he could be beaten, and yet Jim couldn't help but remember the sunpox lesions that spread slowly across his chest, inching toward his heart and lungs. Without the fairy's life-giving transfusions, surely he was doomed to an inglorious death. I couldn't change that even if I wanted to, Jim, sighed the captain when Jim raised it that evening. He's a captain. He's going to have to live or die with the consequences of what he's done. Though Jim couldn't help but detect a note of regret in the captain's voice. More of the crystal coins were bartered for metals, rations and labour throughout their homeward voyage. Whalen had objected most vociferously at first, of course, but soon had to admit that there was more code on one of the coins than he could hope to unpick in a year. And the trades were about more than just food and resources, however desperate they were for those. It was also about circulating the code, making sure it wasn't all in one place, vulnerable to accident or attack. And so, in every port they visited, a few more of the great stash were traded away. They even managed to stop a while in Cinnabar, where a team of carpenters helped to remove the ugly, heavy metalwork that scarred and slowed the ship, and refit her in timber, as was proper. As well as the crystal coins, they distributed the chests of seed wherever they found need, which was almost everywhere. It seemed in their absence to the east and the north, the rice blight had spread, threatening famine among the island nations of the south and west. Rinx was roused from her slow recovery to take samples of the blighted crops, though without her equipment, which Jim had burned beyond hope of repair, there was little that she could do. Raption activity, too, had worsened in recent weeks, apparently starting on the very night of Jim's broadcast, though whether it was the broadcast itself or the disturbance of Lotan leaving his lair for the north, it was impossible to tell. Either way, fear and superstition was renewed among the hungry population, and though there were fewer godsmen to take advantage, Jim quietly wondered who would emerge next to fill the void they left. Rinks was delivered back to Shoalhaven, where she still felt some responsibility to the townspeople. She too was given a good store of the coins, and a team of Arkonauts helped her to her old homestead among the mangroves. Old Loken was still there waiting for her, sitting upon the bench peacefully and quite dead. Words were spoken, and a smattering of tears shed, and then the old Scand was buried in the sandy soil, the crucial recording of his sister's testimony clutched to his breast. Jim lingered for a while beside the grave, remembering the sing-song voice that had mistaken him for a Scand and recited the Ice Cat rhymes, presumably some simple warning to keep the young from wandering up the mountain. The ice cat waits up there on high, Jim whispered, patting the ground and remembering the fierce courage with which the old man had stormed the platform in the square in an effort to save Nix. He made a promise to tell what he knew of Loken's story at the next fire. The last of their crystal coins numbering almost half the total hoard, were entrusted to the fairies of Losselfheim. Gone now were the scars of their battle with the church fleet, though Jim felt that he could still detect a sense of loss and mourning among the fair folk. There was great rejoicing to see Inkainen, the captain, safe, 
and most especially Nix, who was scolded by her parents most fiercely in sign shapes Jim hadn't seen since the trossel, before being wrapped into an embrace that Jim feared might suffocate her. When eventually it relented, and she shared some scrap of her tale with those among her people who understood hand sign, Jim, Gam and Waylon soon found themselves beset by the crushing hugs too, in gratitude for their part in bringing her home. Rinx, unbeknown to Jim, had saved a scrap of the mere tree's genes, the seed of the fair folk, that had held the secret of Thule, and having nurtured this, had entrusted it to the captain to pass to the good mother in a gesture of regret and friendship. The gift was accepted, and an assortment of the old scanned splicing texts were loaded onto the Archon to be gifted to Rinx by way of thanks. There was great celebration among the fair folk that night, and the stories that were told at feast were already woven into song by Moonrise. The Archonauts were invited to the sacred Loon Hall, which now was cleared of the ashes of the burned mere trees, and witnessed for the first time the song of the fairies. Jim saw Nix with her parents and Gam, her eyes shut, and noticed a pinprick of light from the device that nestled behind her left ear. She was home. But it was not to last. Three days later, he watched from the shallow water as she staggered onto the beach. Cap motioned Daj forward, who grasped Nix's tunic, tearing it free from her chest with a single savage motion. Jim felt the adolescent tension among the crew dissipate as they saw that she was prepared and wore a tight binding fabric beneath. Daj winked at her, and Jim suspected this had been her doing. Further up the beach, Cap tore a strip of purple fabric from his ever-shortening tunic before realising clumsily that he needed both his hands for what was to come. Laughing and passing the scrap to slip, he began to speak signing clumsily as he went. Nix of the fair folk, you have rushed into danger without thinking, he said as excited whispers rippled through the assembled Archonauts. You have stolen and profited from that stealing. You have done violence against your fellow man. You have endangered yourself and your crew. And best of all, it took a moment for his hand sign, hastily memorised with Jim's help over the last week, to catch up with the solemn words. You have been told what to do, and have disobeyed. Cap sighed in exaggerated exhaustion from the effort of the signing, and accepted the scrap of cloth back from Slip with a grin, pressing it into Nix's waiting hands. A hush fell over the gathered crew, who watched Nix expectantly for her next move. Raising her left hand, She bound the fabric about her wrist and knuckles like a fighter before thrusting her fist into the air. Puggle squawked, swooping overhead as cheers erupted from the crew who rushed to lift the newest of their number upon their shoulders. The party went on long into the night. Jim, exhausted from the dancing and the laughter, found himself cross-legged on a crate at the edge of the fire's light, watching his friends. Boulder and Kelpie held each other tenderly, laughing as the twins capered about to a tune from North's fist whistle and Caber's drum. Nix, whose appetite for dancing seemed inexhaustible tonight, whirled around with Gam, who was at the limit of his endurance, and sent her spinning toward Waylon to take over. The clumsy techsmith turned out to be surprisingly sure of foot when the rhythm was provided, and the onlookers clapped as the two friends pranced around the fire. I think she'll fit in well enough, don't you? Jim almost fell off his crate. He hadn't heard the captain approach from the small camp they'd made on the beach. A little too well, perhaps, he continued in a low whisper, raising an eyebrow in Gam's direction, who was staring doe-eyed at Nix as she spun Waylon about the fire pit. It's good to have you back, Jim grinned. In truth, he hadn't expected the captain to rejoin the party. He appeared to be back to full strength. His hair had grown back as thickly as ever, and the lines were gone from his face. But he had never quite regained the brightness in his eyes, and he was often to be found alone. Something of the cobalt sea still lingered there. 
Cap seemed to read Jim's thoughts upon his face. It's nothing to worry about. Rinks was right. Something about my splice stopped the water from killing me. But she thinks it's changed, somehow. The splice, I mean. Changed how? Jim asked simply, surprised to find the captain so willing to talk. Won't know for sure until she gets herself set up again. Cap shrugged, then seemed to lose himself in the fire. I can feel it, though. Inside. That treasure was my best chance yet at fulfilling my promise. At building somewhere for everyone to call home. I just worry I won't get another. If the hourglass starts turning again. He drew a deep breath and slapped Jim on the shoulder, forcing a smile. Sorry. I'm feeling sorry for myself, aren't I? You had some of the treasure. A small fortune. And you gave most of it away. Well, yes admitted the captain, taken aback by Jim's words. But that wasn't enough, really. Only a fraction of what we could have had. It was more important to get it. It was more than we needed, interrupted Jim. Did you never ask yourself why nobody complained when you gave it away to Saar? Yes, I saw that. Or to Rinks? Or the good mother? The captain just blinked at him, unused to being spoken to this frankly. Jim stared at his feet. You knew I came from Rosine, didn't you? Yes, admitted the captain quietly. Everything you've done since leaving Saar. I didn't really understand. Not until it had all fallen apart and it looked like we were going to be stranded on Thule, or worse. Nobody followed you that far for riches, or to try and build a place to call home. They did it because we already have a place to call home. You already built it. We all did. All of our damned shirts are in the sails. Our blood is in the timbers. And she sat right out there at anchor. He jabbed a metal finger toward the moonlit silhouette of the Archon that silently kept watch over the bay. Cap stood and walked a few paces across the sand toward her, wiping his eyes before planting his hands on his hips and staring out over the water. Jim rose and stood beside him, and then the captain's hand was on his shoulder. Well, Jim, where to next? Epilogue Kira blinked against the glare of light from the room beyond. For the thousandth time, she reminded herself that it couldn't be wrong. Not really. Not if she was doing it for the baby. They had tried three times now, and it had always ended in heartbreak. Now with Hef gone, well, she only had one chance to save some small part of him, and she wasn't going to take any chances. This was taking chances, warned a familiar voice in her head. Getting on a boat with some mad old hermit was taking chances. But for the thousand and oneth time, she pushed the warning down deep inside herself. Pregnant girls had been going to splicers for centuries. It might be tech, it might be heresy, but it worked. She hadn't been able to afford it, of course, or she'd have used one after the first miscarriage. Her half had worked on the scrapping boats and she sorted plastics for a living. It would have taken them five years of scrimping and saving to go to the local splicer. No, poor folk like them, all they had was prayer, and good pars were few and far between these days, after all the trouble in the north. But this time the prayers had been answered. A new splicer, just travelling through. Some old spiritual type, living out his days, just looking to help. That's how it had seemed, anyway. Full of questions he was, at first. How old was she? Did she have any family nearby to help with the child? What of the father? How sorry he was to hear of Hef's accident. What manner of man was Hef? How tall, how fair? She'd stepped willingly onto the man's small boat, trying not to flinch at the touch of his metal hand as he helped her aboard. Lots of men lost limbs at sea. It wasn't kind to stare. She marvelled at his skill with the boat and the swiftness with which they reached his home. 
Hef had always said the nearest island was three days' sail, though the trip in the small catboat took only a few hours. But things hadn't felt right from the moment she set foot on the hermit's shore. The island was grim and bare, and the men that worked the fields nearby seemed to shuffle about like they hadn't slept in weeks. And then the door that led to his workshop led into the hillside. That was almost too much for her. Now she found herself in a dark chamber, lit only by great glass vats of liquid that bubbled with an eerie blue light. Creatures seemed to float in the liquid, connected to metal tendrils, though she tried not to look or think too hard about what they could be. It couldn't be wrong, not really, not if she was doing it for the baby. The hermit returned, and it seemed that his crown of wiry grey hair had grown more wild than before. Kira flinched as she realised that the hand of his metal arm was gone now, and in its place was a wide glass vial from which protruded a long, thick needle. You must hold very still for this next part, he cautioned, and at a jerk of his head metal tendrils snaked from somewhere in the darkness to clasp her by the wrist, neck and ankle, and she cried out in alarm. Still, the old man snapped, a scowl on the beardless face that had seemed so kindly in daylight. What? What's the needle for? asked Kira, forcing as much dignity and calm into her voice as she could muster. You thought perhaps I was going to burn some herbs and say a prayer, taunted the man without looking up. This is medicine, girl, real medicine. Blood texts made by the scanned themselves. Kira shivered as he lifted what looked like a yellowed, bloody fingernail from a beaker with a steel claw, then dropped it into the glass vial that fed the needle. What's that? gasped Kira, any pretense of calm abandoning her. The old splicer raised the vial and squinted at the fingernail. The glass grotesquely magnified his eye, which seemed now to be lit from within by a dull red glow. Blood, girl. Very special blood. The boy from whom I took it will be the child's father, in a sense. Clear liquid wept from the point of the needle as he drew closer. Kira tried to swallow, but found her mouth suddenly dry. But the baby? It'll be healthy? She asked, unable to keep her voice from trembling. He hesitated then, his lip curling, though it felt more like a sneer than a smile. Oh yes, dear, said the old man softly. You will carry a fine, strong boy. And I promise you, if he is anything like his father, he will live a long, Long time, indeed. The End We hope you have enjoyed this audiobook production of Tales of the Risen Tide.